What's up guys, Rick from DFS On Demand here, and this is a preview for the Players' Championship. So it doesn't get much more exciting than this. It's a star-studded field, an awesome golf course, large prize pool, and all of the people flocking to DraftKings to give us their money. So let's not waste any more time and let's get right into this thing. Uh, here are my key stats for the week. If you've never seen this sheet before, it's available on DFSOnDemand.com. You can see at the bottom, a lot of different cool tabs on here, but this is the key stats, something that has been really accurate and I've leaned on quite a bit this season. The metrics that we're going for this week are going to be driving accuracy, which tends to be a pretty good indicator for success here at TPC Sawgrass much better than um, driving distance. So five of the last 13 players champions have ranked inside the top 10 for driving accuracy that week. Um, driving distance, only two of the last 13 champions have ranked in the top 10. So I would say accuracy is a little bit more important than uh, distance this week. Strokes gained approach, going to be very important. This is a tough course. This is where the guys are kind of going to separate themselves from the field. So I want guys that are going to be throwing darts. They're going to be hitting it closer than the field. Um, you know, this is usually an indicator, especially depending on how, how many fairways they hit. You know, this strokes gained approach is kind of an all-encompassing stat that we haven't used much this year, but I do like it for this week. Scrambling is another one that's pretty consistent for uh, this course, for TPC Sawgrass. We see a lot of the champions end up um, you know, ranked really high in scrambling, but even so, predictively, um, coming in, they're usually ranked pretty high, or, or, or they finish the year in the top like 40 in scrambling is where we see a ton of these champions come from. So I think a prerequisite is you have to be really good around the greens. Um, par fours, 450 yards or longer is going to come into play. There are five of them, five of the par fours. So there's only, let's see, nine on the course. Five of them are over 450 yards, which is pretty rare. Um, so we're going to lean on that a little bit. And then of course, this, this course is going to play, uh, pretty difficult. There's going to be a lot of bogeys out there, so we are going to take the guys that are going to avoid those bogeys. Uh, so spoiler alert, there's all the guys that rank pretty high, but, but let's go through them. All right, I don't think I need to spend too much time here at the top. It's a star-studded field. Everyone's in play, but let's talk about a couple of these guys. Um, Dustin Johnson, I... I don't need to tell you about. He is the odds-on favorite. He nearly won four straight tournaments that he's teed it up in. Dustin Johnson's the best player in the world right now. If you've watched any video I've ever put together, I'll tell you how much I love Rory McIlroy. Um, looking at his game logs coming in, and he hasn't played a lot on tour this year, but what you get is... Uh, an unbelievable talent. When he has played, he's played awesome. Here are basically the four uh, worldwide tournaments that he's played basically that can accrue DraftKings points this year. No worse than T7. Uh, hasn't teed it up since the Masters where he had a T7. Played awesome at the Arnold Palmer, which is going to be a tough track. I mean, these are really tough courses. The, the World Golf Championship, I mean, these are legit, legit fields. Rory finds his way to the top in all of them. His history here, let's find Rory. He's right here. So the last four years, no, worth that, no worse than a tie for 12th, three top 10s. Um, again, not a, not a guy I should have to convince you on. He's, he's excellent. Sergio Garcia has a ton of history here. So probably playing um, the best golf he's ever played coming off the, the major win at the Masters. You know, two out of the or three out of the last four years, he's had a top ten here. He won it back in two thousand and eight, a second back in two thousand and seven. I mean, just a per, a guy who's made fifteen out of seventeen cuts, six top tens here. You should have plenty of him. All right, uh, let's go to the key stats now for the next two guys. Hideki Matsuyama, after a blistering start to the season has slowed down just a little bit, right? Just by his standards. So, um, you know, he wins the waste management, then 
he gets cut. T25 at the at the World Golf Championships, which is a smaller field anyway. T45 at the Arnold Palmer, pretty uninspiring, but starting to round into shape with the T11 at the Masters. And if we look at our key stats here, here's Hideki Matsuyama. Uh, really makes his uh, his hay at the two stats that are basically for this course, which are these long par fours and really good around the greens. Uh, you know, notoriously, he's a, he's been a bad putter in his career. He's turned that around a bit this season, which is why he's probably found so much success. But uh, the scrambling stats are undeniable for this season. So um, Matsuyama jumps out there. Ricky Fowler, probably my favorite play of the week, probably a little biased because he ranks my, my key stats here, uh, my number one golfer. And you can see why. Four out of these five stats, he's in the top six. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty good. So a 92 score, which is really, really good. Um, probably one of the top eight or ten scores we've seen this season. Um, just having having a really great year. Let's look at his recent form. Um, so recent form. Excellent, right? I mean, just a lot of top 10s, piling them up, a lot of top 15s. But he's had really mixed results here, which is why I think his price is so low. So Fowler is not the defending champion, Jason Day is, but Fowler won it two years ago. But he then got cut last year. So let's look at this performance, and you're going to see how volatile this is. Um, so this performance tab is sorted by average finish. So if you have a 10th place and a 20th place, add them together, that's 30, two trips. It's an average position of, or an average finish of 15. Um, uh, Ricky comes all the way in here at 81st, which is a little bit deceptive. And it's deceptive because of how many times he's missed the cut. So he missed the cut last year trying to defend his title. He missed it in 20, what would that have been? 2013. Uh, missed it in 2011 and missed it in 2010. So not good. So that kills the average. But, you know, he has mixed in a second place and a win here. Combine that with his recent form, his key stats, and this price tag. And I'm like, damn, like, what's what's Ricky going to be this week? Um, I, I think he's a GPP play. And it comes down to his course history. He just hasn't put it together often enough to to roll him out in cash games but i think he's the perfect gpp play uh a guy like me who's going to play a lot of gpps i think ricky fits into quite a bit of my lineups all right a couple of really appealing plays here in the high 8000s and even i guess the 8000s in general um adam scott here at 8400 was a little disappointing for me last week at the Wells Fargo, uh, but really showed up at the Masters. He's a guy who you can roll out at a lot of these big time events and have no problem with it. Let's look up Adam Scott here. Okay, so in terms of uh, history here, you can see he had a T12 last year, you know, has made 12 out of 15 cuts. He has three top 10s. Remember, he's won this tournament before. It was all the way back in 2004, but I mean, the pedigree to win this is going to be great. Um, you can see a lot of top 15s, a lot of top 20s since then. I think he's certainly viable. I have another tidbit on him we'll save for the end of this when we get to the odds. But keep, keep Adam Scott in mind. A couple of guys who are probably priced incorrectly. Well, we'll talk about that. But, but Patrick Reed, you know, 54-hole uh, leader last week, finishes T12 after shooting a 75 not good, but compare that to the recent form that we've seen for Patrick Reed. For him to go out and shoot 70, 71, 67 and lead a golf tournament after three rounds has me interested. Um, because it was a long time before he started, before he was putting a bunch of good rounds together. You know, coming into the Wells Fargo, his, his recent form was not very good. Let's see what he's done here in the past. Whoops, sorry guys, let's see if I can find this. 
I refresh the page, sorry. Here we go. Um, so he's only played here three times, which I thought was pretty interesting because because Patrick Reed's like been pretty good for a lot longer than three years, but has only played here three times, cut twice, but a top 25. So again, here is another GPP play where I would never trust this guy in cash games. Recent form's not good. Um, course history isn't particularly great, but I'm trying to buy into these types of players before they go off and win something. And we almost saw it last week at the at the Wells Fargo. Patrick Reed almost we almost got out ahead of it and he almost won it. So those are the type of players that that go out and win you GPPs. Kevin Kisner's really interesting. And I think that he's going to be popular, but I'm not positive. Um, so here's the thing. So Kisner's, you know, recent form going into last week was pretty good, right? Really good. He's he, he's having an excellent season. You can see his price tag was was um heading up and up and up, and then you know, what you're not even seeing here is you're not seeing the, the team event. You're not seeing the Zurich where Kisner chips in on 18 to get into a playoff. They end up finishing second, but Kisner played awesome. Then he goes out and misses the cut at the Wells Fargo. So we're going to have a lot of casual players this week who might not really know who Kevin Kisner is. Um, having a great year, you know, you can blame last week the missed cut. You can blame that on playing the extra day in the playoff you know, having to stay at Eagle Point um, until Monday, and or I'm sorry, at um, at the Zurich until Monday, and having this really emotional week, and you know he shows up late to Wells Fargo and gets cut. Like we can kind of forgive him for that, and then we can buy back in. And you can see here, two years ago, Kevin Kisner only played this tournament twice. He got cut last year, but two years ago he had a, had a T2. So. He's had good success. This is probably the best form he's ever had coming into this event. I think that's fair to say. And, you know, the miscut last week might drive a couple of people away. So I do think that he's interesting. All right, I'll try to go quick here and point out a few more guys. I mean, this is such a great field. I love so many different players. But let's look at... My main man. Here we go. Brendan Steele at 6,900. That is a steal. See what I did there? Okay. Uh, Brendan Steele uh, having a really good year. He is... Let's go to my key stats here. Where is he? Here we go. Brendan Steele, number one in scrambling and number three in bogey avoidance. So those two probably go hand in hand, considering he can get up and down as often as he does, so he doesn't make a lot of bogeys. So those two kind of go hand in hand, but they're both going to be very, very important this week. He's also 22nd in strokes gained approach, holds his own in the other categories for me, and just completely, you know, 6900 bucks is nothing. Um, Steel is a guy who can get really hot. If you're playing on FanDuel, where there are bigger bonuses for making multiple birdies in a row, Steele is even more appealing because he is a very streaky player. So that's the kind of stuff that we want to tap into on the sites that are providing more bonuses for uh, multiple birdie streaks. And then there's a couple, let's see, Norin again, just, you know, 6,800 bucks is just probably not enough coming off of his good week last week. Um, and then there's somebody else. Oh, Kyle Stanley. Let's look at Kyle Stanley here. T8 at the Shell Houston. T17 at the Arnold Palmer, which is going to be a similar type field. Just a really, really tough field. Uh, decent at the Valspar. He's had some pretty high finishes. Again, here's another tough field. That's what I'm looking for. The Farmers Insurance Open of top 15 there. And that's another really tough field. And if you didn't notice it by now, he's number two in my rankings. Um, no worse than what 29th in any of these categories just destroys those long par fours, really good at avoid, avoiding bogeys, excellent on approach shots, very accurate. I mean, there's your value play. Gotta love Kyle Stanley. And then I've got one more value play and it's Zach Blair, who's 6,500, which hold on a second. Let's take a peek. Yeah, that's what I thought. 6,500 is the minimum min price. Zach Blair, 
coming off a T12 a couple weeks ago at the Shell Houston T8. Uh, not so great outside of that, but you get the point playing well. And then here's another guy, excellent around the greens. Of course, scrambling and bogey avoidance again correlate with each other. Concern here, concern here about uh, a stat that I'm really weighing heavily, stroke, strokes gained approach, um, where he does not really fair very well but he's going to hit a lot of fairways he's going to give himself a lot of chances uh being the 11th best in the field in driving accuracy so for the min price geez oh man can't do much worse than that so uh zach blair pretty good um and let's finish up with the odds here like we always do see if we can find some values so this is sorted by salary and i will tell you DraftKings did a pretty good job here on pricing this week there's not a lot of blatant mispricing uh, but I will say Ricky Fowler just slightly underpriced. So he is 20 to 1, which is the same price as Jason Day and Hideki Matsuyama. But Ricky Fowler is uh, 400 bucks cheaper than Mats Matsuyama and $700 cheaper than Jason Day. Adam Scott, here's that little tidbit that I said I was saving 33 to 1, which is the same odds as Hedrick Stenson. But uh, Adam Scott is $400 cheaper. And, you know, there's guys like Kevin Chappell who are more expensive and much longer shot odds to win this thing. Um, Kucher, a little bit underpriced. Again, here we go, Kevin Kisner. Kevin Kisner is priced below Jason Duffner, and he's 55 to 1 compared to Duffner's 80 to 1. Phil Mickelson is always hard to read because he's a very public player, so his odds could be influenced because of all the public money as opposed to what his actual true odds to win are, but you get the point. Um, this range right here, Keimer, Berger, Watson, probably all underpriced. Schwartzel, probably underpriced. Um, these guys probably way overpriced. <laughs> uh John Ha, Song Gil No, Robert Strav, those guys are probably overpriced. Um, let's see here. Any other ones that jump out? Grace a little bit here, right? Um, at least compared to his counterparts, he's got much better odds to win this thing. Where's Zach Blair? Where did he end up checking in? 350 to 1. Wow. I mean, I know it's hard to win a golf tournament, but that seems a little... Seems a little bad. Um, okay, that's basically it. So if you guys have any questions, uh, tweet me. It's at DFS On Demand or leave a comment below. Um, again, this spreadsheet's available on DFSOnDemand.com. I'll try to expand it and continue to add stuff as the week goes on. But uh, yeah, there you go. Best of luck, and I'll talk to you guys soon. See ya.